So um, I am going to happily say that I know half the panel. <laughs> um, and I, I'm not going to make the introductions. They will introduce themselves. So I suppose I'll pass it over to you, Sarah, so we could get this started. Perfect. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'm Sarah Shepard from the career team. Really glad that you're all here today. Um, a couple housekeeping notes we are recording just for students who couldn't make it today. Um, if you could send your CWID or Mercy email to uh, the host just so we can record attendance, that would be very helpful. Um, and we will now introduce you to the panelists. So first up, we have Demetra, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi guys, thanks for having me tonight. My name is Demetra Tizanis and I'm actually a graduate from Mercy College myself. I graduated with my bachelor's of, in psychology in 2019 and my master's in psychology in 2020. I currently work full time as a medical scribe at White Plains Hospital in radiation oncology. I also work part time as a behavioral therapist for children. Um, in addition, I'm finishing up a certification in victim advocacy right now through Stony Brook University. And I'm excited to say I was just accepted into a second master's program at Alfred University for clinical mental health counseling. Awesome, congratulations, glad to hear that. Thank you. And Danielle Wollenberg, you're up next. Sure. Thank you for having me. So my name is Danielle and I am a current volunteer recruitment manager for the American Red Cross of Greater New York. I have my bachelor's degree in social welfare and I have my master's degree in public administration and have worked for various large nonprofits, including Habitat for Humanity, AmeriCorps uh, and Catholic Charities. Wonderful. Thank you for being here. And Laura? Hi, I'm Laura Hemberger, and I've taken a kind of serendipitous route through since I graduated from undergrad in psychology. And then I actually was a special education teacher and then went and got a master's in special education and then ended up in a master's program for developmental psychology and was lucky enough to get my PhD with Dr. Zavala. And so yes, in cognitive science. And then I went on and I did a postdoc in data analysis and data science. And that's how I've ended up running analytics for an advertising firm here in the city. Thank you. Sounds like a fun career path. And how about you, Eve? Hi. Okay. Hi. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with you tonight. Um, again, my name is Eve Vavel. Um, I am a licensed master social worker. I currently work for the Alzheimer's Association. I also currently work um, as a fee-for-service um, therapist, psychotherapist at the Jewish Board and Family Services, as well as the Brooklyn Counseling Services um, Center. Um, I've been uh, a social worker for many years. Since 2003, I got my, um, my master's in social work. And I recently, oh, three years ago, got my license as a therapist. Um, in my journey, I've worked in various social service fields. Um, I started out in, pre um, in social welfare, where um, I started out uh, in foster care, where I worked as a case manager, and then went on to work in preventive services, um, a family support center. Um, then I became an administrator, um, in a home care agency, I worked my way up and I was the executive director of a $25 million organization for 12 years. Um, I think it was about five years ago, I decided to change my career and I went, I, I took a, a position at the Alzheimer's Association where um, my title is care and support program manager. Um, and a year uh, and a half ago, decided to focus on my clinical 
uh, career as a therapist. And so this is one of the reasons why I have, um, I'm working for two mental health um, clinics um, as a psychotherapist, working on getting my clinical uh, social work degree. So it's been a pleasure so far for me to be working for this organization. And I'm looking forward to answering your questions, to talk about why I'm making all these career move changes. Um, any questions that you have, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much. I bet when you were in college, you would have never known the career path that you would have gone on. And I no think idea. a lot of us can say the same. So thank you so much. Uh, and next, we're, we have some students in the room assigned to some questions, so I'll let you guys take it away. Hello, my name is Tiffany. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to ask you these questions. Um, my question is, what are some specific skills that you learned in college that you have found useful in your career? Demetra, well, if you wanna, oh, I'm sorry. Eve, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that I learned in college, I, and I don't think I said I went to Brooklyn College. Um, you know, I spent my, I did my undergrad in uh, French. Uh, language. Um, and I think some of the, you know, skills that I feel that I learned that has been beneficial to me in the career path that I've gone through is, um, you know, public speaking skills. I think it was very, um, you know, very early on um, when I noticed that, you know, when professors or administrators at the school, you know, have said to me, hey, you know, um, I like the way you speak. I like the way you talk. And so um, I think public speaking skills was one of the skills that, you know, I found very helpful in learning in my undergrad, which, you know, has brought me to where I am today, you know, um, in a career as a public speaker where I do presentations for a living. For myself, um, learning in undergrad and grad, a lot of research experience, learning how to manage SPSS and data collection has really helped me um, through any research that I've been doing right now. I'm actually working on three different research studies, all for publication with re, um, professors from Mercy who have given me the opportunity to do so. In addition, um, in my master's program, we took a class called Group Experience and you learn all about counseling and group counseling and how to deal with clients on a daily basis. And that's really helped me through behavioral therapy and also working at the hospital and just patient care overall. Um, so for me, uh, learning from my undergraduate experience in social welfare, uh, one of the biggest skills I learned was how to compartmentalize and make sure that I don't take home me some of um, my clients' emotions that they have. So it really was great to kind of work through that in a classroom setting, just to kind of learn those skills of making sure I'm not taking these home and making sure I kind of have that work-life balance. In undergrad, I also took a couple of language courses and uh, having other language skills is very useful. Even if you know some of the basics, it can kind of really get you far um, in just reaching some of those communication barriers. Um, and then in grad school, I went for my master's in public administration at Syracuse University. Um, and part of that master's was really focused on nonprofit management. I was able to learn how to write an effective memo because in a lot of other office setting positions, you really need to know how to write a convincing memo to get your point across. So I thought that that was an extremely useful skill because it can even translate into daily emails of how you kind of can write an email. So it seems like a silly skill, but it was extremely useful to have learned that specific skill set. That, that is a very true fact. And I would, <laughs> for myself, I would add in time management and just like what has a priority and what like has to get done right here, right now. 
versus what can I put off and just wait and do tomorrow so I could at least, you know, go eat dinner and have a good night's sleep and such. And then also just having a experience of going through a lot of different classes and courses and such. Like, I got to tell you, I was not the biggest fan of certain things. And here I am doing analytics. Well, it's because I love statistics, but honestly, I hated probability. I still to this day, like do not want to talk about conditional or unconditional probability, but I wouldn't have known that if I didn't take the classes and, you know, maybe I got by this, by the skin of my teeth, but Hey, I passed and nobody needs to know anything else other than I passed. Um, I'd like to add something to that. Um, you, Laura just reminded me that one of the things that I did in uh, undergrad is I traveled um, and I went to France. And I think this is where I kind of like develop my ability to study. Um, you know, I, I mean, there are some people who were born with, you know, the best, you know, the ability to remember. And I was not one of these people. So learning how to study learning what works for me. Um, you know, I realized that I was a, you know, I was not the type of person that can come home and do homework. I was not the type of person that could come home and study. I realized that I did my best studying at 6 a.m. in the morning after a good night's sleep. Um, this is when I was able, um, after a very tiring day, my brain was not ready to did not want to continue learning. So I think that was something that I realized while I was in France, you know, the type of person that I am and how I can learn best, how I can study. Awesome answers and questions, everyone. And who do we have up next? The next question, Imani. It's me. Hi. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, what would you tell yourself back in college, knowing what you know now? I would definitely tell myself not to stress as much as I did and that everything is going to work out for the best because the road you sometimes think you're going to take isn't necessarily how it's going to end in the long run. So it's okay to take a different pathway to get to the goal at the end. Um, I think that I would tell myself uh, that all the extra classes I took, so I was somebody who tried to make the most of my undergraduate experience and I would take extra courses that I didn't need. And I wish I had told myself to audit it instead of taking it for credit. Because uh, if I had a class that was just like, extra. I didn't care as much about what the grade was because it wasn't part of my degree program, but it's part of your overall grade. Um, and if you kind of focus on the higher GPA, then that can give you more opportunities for scholarships in grad school. So even though my GPA was still good, if I had an even better GPA, like I took one class in Latin that uh, brought down my GPA a little bit, where sometimes I look back and be like, okay, well, maybe if I audited that class instead, um, then it could have given me more odds of a scholarship or a bigger scholarship for grad school. That's a great one too. And I would say um, to your earlier point, Danielle, I realized I spent a lot of time stressing over writing emails to professors and um, then you just get back maybe like four letters like okay and then their initials. So don't stress so much over the small things. And absolutely, there needs to be that work-life balance and that you're, it's undergrad, you need to live your life and experience life. And trying to learn that is, it's really hard. I'm still not sure I've learned balance in anything yet, but we're striking that balance is really important and just getting that breadth of coursework and having exposure to things that I really never thought I would actually be interested in is, I think, extremely important. Yeah. Um, I would tell myself that every challenge, everything that a professor is trying to teach me as hard, as difficult as a class may be, and as tough as some professors might be, um, at the end of the day, I'm learning what real life is. 
which is something I tell my children, um, you know, I'm learning what real life is all about. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be hoops to jump. And so if we make it through this class, if we learn to deal with, you know, this professor's, um, you know, ways of grading and behavior or attitude of the way that they teach or the accent that they speak with, you know, if we learn to deal with that, you know, this is what real life is about. So it's about being prepared. And, um, and I would also add, I would tell myself, do exactly, you know, um, what I did in, in um, undergrad, really enjoy my time, you know, um, get involved with extracurricular activities, you know, make making friends, you know, while in college, you know, is important. It's not just studying 24 hours a day. It's, you know, being part of a club, being part of something that will help you to, you know, to learn social skills, to get to know other people, to get to know other cultures, you know, travel if you can, you know, whenever you can explore, you know, what's happening, you know, what else is out there of, you know, the boroughs that you live in or, you know, the city that you live in. There's just so much out there. I couldn't agree more. And you learn so much about yourself in that whole process learning from others. And who do we have up next? Hi, how you doing? My name is Nathaniel Kramer. But um, my question is for you today is, uh, could you tell us more about your job and some things that you might, you know, uh, enjoy about it? Do I go first or is it Demetra? I could go. Um, so I currently have two jobs, as I mentioned in my introduction. Full time, I am at White Plains Hospital in radiation oncology. So a little bit separate from the field of psychology. When I took on this job, I wanted to gain more clinical experience, not thinking that radiation oncology would have so much to tie in with psychology, but it has so much to do with each other. Um, working in the field, I've gained so much knowledge in just the medical field, as well as like clinical practice, patient care. And in addition, there's been so many connections with psychological pathology. And I've met patients dealing with serious mental illnesses, including depression, psychosocial problems, schizophrenia, bipolar one and two disorder, suicidal ideation, addictions, cognitive impairments. So it's been a worthwhile experience there um, working as a behavioral therapist. I work with children and it's uh, all on the spectrum, behavioral disorders, ADHD, and to just help them with their everyday skills, work on them becoming more comfortable in themselves and to be more independent. Um. So a little bit more about my job. Again, I work for the American Red Cross of Greater New York as a volunteer recruitment manager. So what that means is I get to recruit amazing volunteers and interns and tell them about our many opportunities on a daily basis. And I get to post uh, positions online. I get to speak with prospective volunteers in person about our opportunities. And I get to manage current volunteers and interns to help with different tasks. Um, I also have opportunities to recognize our volunteers with different recognition events. And I also am able to deploy potentially to assist if there is a large disaster. So everybody at the Red Cross, volunteers, staff, interns, they all have opportunities to assist and get their um, involved with any sort of large disaster. So I deployed at one point to help out at Hurricane in Florida for two weeks and was able to really kind of support uh, some of the shelters and the different operations down there. Um, and before I did my role right now with volunteer services, I was working actually at national headquarters in Washington, DC as a 
for the International Services Department, helping with the Restoring Family Links program. So I helped reconnect families who were separated internationally by war, migration, and disaster, and did various parts of the casework process, and was able to partner with some of our international uh, entities across the globe in order to really help reconnect these families, which was an amazing opportunity. I got to be honest with you guys, I work for an advertising firm and I am not saving lives. Um, thank you, Danielle, for doing what you do. I feel really embarrassed with what I'm about to say. So you know how you're watching TV and you're on Hulu and an ad comes up that you swear to God you were talking in the other room and somehow you got served an ad on Instagram. Yes, absolutely. I am those people and I am the one that is getting you served those ads and then getting the feedback back from it. I'm really sorry. And yes, everything that you think is going on is and privacy is not a joke. And absolutely do not put any of those listening devices uh, like Alexa and things in your bedroom. I'm not joking. So what do I do? So I run a team of different analysts and we're looking at paid search, looking at um, your SEO, your SEM, or, I'm sorry, those are search engine optimizations for landing pages for different websites, looking at search engine um, different marketing tools and such. So why do you type in a word? Like, I don't even know. Um, I, give me, you know, you type in a word to Google and why do the certain searches come up as the way they do? There's an order to that and they pay, the, we pay for it. It's all really about putting the money where it needs to be. Um, all your Facebook, all your advertising, any of your social platforms. Then looking at how do we integrate all of that data on the back end and then also tie it in with the back end of the client's website's performance. So that's a lot of Google Analytics, setting up different dashboards. So Google, um, Google Data Studios and such. Maybe also if there's like CRM. So that's more looking at if you're looking at sales teams and such, integrating that with Salesforce. So really, I'm kind of like a you know, I, I'm kind of organizing the woods of all these different things and trying to make sense of it. So I love, I love seeing what the numbers are going to say. Also, it takes a lot of the behavior science in the sense of like, what is like, you know, numbers can tell you a lot, but like, let's think through this of like, what is the consumer actually doing and what are they actually watching and looking at different targeting segments, audience profiles and such, and going from there. But Unfortunately, the worst part of it is realizing um, data is no joke and anything and everything you're doing online is always being captured. I'm really sorry, someone's listening. <laughs> Uh, tough act to follow. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, I don't know whether or not you guys were able to date me. Um, I, you know, I have a very long background. Um, you know, you, before I tell you about what I currently do, um, you know, just kind of want to, because I understand that you are students in the behavioral sciences um, major, and you are an undergrad, and so you're preparing your path, you know, and one of the things that's interesting about, you know, the, the road that I've taken, you know, um, I feel like first I ended up in social services because my BA was in French. But what I what was important is that I knew I wanted to be um, I wanted to help people. And so this is why um, I, I wanted to be an interpreter to be able to help, you know, those who are, you know, unable to communicate. And so I am you know, somehow doing that right now in, in my career in social services. But, um, but for me to get there, yeah, I, I started out, um, let's say I spent most of my career as an administrator. So I have a master's in social work. And, um, and I want to tell you that because, you know, the your degree does not necessarily mean that you're going to be, um, you know, a, a psychotherapist. You know, if you have, depending on what you're what you're specializing, 
your, you know, you can fly anywhere. You can go anywhere you want to go with, um, with your mental health degree or your social work degree, if that's what you decide to pursue. I was an administrator running a, a home care organization for many, many years. Um, and then I decided to go and work for the Alzheimer's Association as a public speaker. Um, a program manager running programs to help educate um, you know, the, the public about, bring awareness about Alzheimer's disease. Um, so I was doing public education. I was also doing a little bit of counseling to caregivers. Um, you know, I was organizing events, going to health fairs and letting people uh, be aware about, um, about the, the disease and about how to get help. Um, and so I know um, also public health um, degrees also do that, but a social worker can also be a public speaker as well. Um, at this time at the Alzheimer's Association, I made a change. Um, I decided to become part-time so that I can focus my career in, um, in the clinical in the clinical realm instead of um, administrative. Um, and so right now at the Alzheimer's Association, I'm doing some of the work that Danielle is doing at the Red Cross, where I am you know, helping with volunteer engagement. I am, you know, uh, I work in trying to access volunteers, people who want to donate their time so that they can learn more about um, about this this business so that they can learn more and so that they can it can help with their career choices. Um, and so I work in doing some of the work like posting on websites, trying to find people who can volunteer. Um, I do volunteer fairs. I also go to different events to promote the Alzheimer's Association. That's that job. And, um, and as you, you've heard, I also work for two mental health organizations. And so I do psychotherapy. I work with both adults and one of the organizations. And then at the Jewish board at BCS, I work with adults, mainly adults. And at, at Jewish board, I work with families and mainly children where I'm acquiring different skills to, to better help um, little children. Thank you. Wonderful answers, guys. I am still very much concerned about the device listening in my room that I'm not going to say her name right now because I'm just going to talk back. Yep. Thank you, guys. Um, all right. Who do we have up next? Hi, my question for you is what do you love most about your job? I think the thing I love most about my job is that even though there's some challenging days with clients when they are just not feeling themselves or having an outburst or just an overall difficult day in general, the times that they accomplish a new goal or overcome a behavior is so powerful and it makes all the difficult days worthwhile. So I think that's what I love most about my job is seeing my clients achieve something that they've been working so hard to achieve. Awesome. Um, so what I think I would like, or what I do like most about my job is that I just work for a very large humanitarian organization that just has a very large reach and that I know that whenever there's any sort of disaster going on, I'm kind of part of that network of amazing volunteers and staff who are on the ground helping people. So if I'm watching the news, I see that there's like a tornado going on or everything going on with the pandemic. I know that I work for an organization who's kind of like at the heart of trying to help and make a difference in just everybody's lives. And specifically with disaster, I first got interested in the disaster field because uh, when I was trying to figure out what population to work with, with social work, I realized that disaster affects everybody and it also exacerbates other problems. So to me, I found it fascinating that it can really be anybody. Anybody can be affected by a disaster. So you get a little bit of everything within uh, this specific field. Man, going after Danielle is really rough. Um, I'm going to be on. I did. I was in academia. I was a professor, and 
I have worked with patients in the past and I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I love doing those things and it filled my heart, but, and the thing I love most about my job now is my 401k and my health insurance. And that's honest to God, the truth, because I needed to pay back student loans and corporate America pays really well. I'm not going to tell you I'm saving lives. Never forget advertising. No one's going to die. <laughs> Unless you show us some really odd <laughs> thing. I'm like, oh, no. Um, so really interesting um, stuff here. Um, what I love, I'm kind of like in the area um, going where Laura went with her. Um, what she loved most about her job is I love. OK, so you've heard about the changes that I've made. So I left an executive director position where I was in charge of everything. I was in charge of everybody. I was in charge of human um, services. I had over a thousand employee. Why did I leave? I first I wanted to be in charge of myself and not everybody else. The second thing is I left for an organization and I want to tell you that I actually got a pay cut when I left. When I, as an executive director, I, I also left like a $10,000 a year bonus because um, joining the Alzheimer's Association was, you know, um, a very important decision for me. Um, the Alzheimer's Association is a national organization. Um, so that means we have a chapter in every state. So as soon as I came into the Alzheimer's Association, I started to travel. So when they have meetings, they're having meetings in Chicago, they're having meetings and, you know, and, you know, in other state, they're having um, meetings in Europe, you know, so, um, so being part of that, you know, was very important for me. So I soon, you know, so know what you're getting, you know, into. So you can go into an organization, you know, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be a line staff public speaking, but if it's a national organization, you have the ability to travel, <laughs> to go different places, you know, like read what else is involved in the package that you're getting. And I also want to say that, you know, with all three of the jobs that I have, so I have three part-time jobs. So um, I'm still, I'm still recovering from the fact that um, I don't have PTO right now, paid time off. <laughs> so if I, if I take a day off, um, I have to figure out, oh my God, how much money did I just lose? But, but I love the flexibility that I have as a, you know, at the Alzheimer's Association, I'm part-time. And one of the reasons why I'm part-time is because I tried to leave, but wanting to stay, wanting to kind of like make some stable um, have some, um, you know, stability in my, in my pay, because as a fee for service and the other, um, fields is like, if a client don't show up, you don't get paid. So, um, even though I'm part-time with them, they kind of know I was leaving. So I'm kind of still kind of like my own boss. So they, they, they're giving me contracts, um, or different, um, job opportunities to do. I was supposed to leave in February, but I'm still there because they gave me something else to do um, so that I could stay with them as a consultant. Um, but the flexibility that I have as a fee for service is just wonderful. You know, to be able to see patients whenever I want to right now with COVID, um, you know, that we're doing a lot virtual. So I see a lot of my patients virtual um, in my own home, in my own office. So the flexibility and the travel is something that I love right now at this point in my career. Now, remember, I, I, I hope you can understand what I mean at this point in my career, because I've worked for how many years? <laughs> you know, but maybe 25 years, you know, in my life. So at this point, I'm looking for flexibility. I'm also a businesswoman. Um, I'm a, I'm a landlord. I own homes. And so, you know, I'm doing other things, you know, um, and so that's, that's very important that you can tap into different opportunities as you're growing in your career. Awesome. Thank you guys. And who do we have up next? Hello, everyone. Alex. Um, my question is in talking about what you like most, what is it that you like least about your job? 
So a pretty short answer to this question. The thing I probably like least about my job is the hours. I work about 12 hours a day, seven to seven every day of the week. Um, and then I work on the weekends as well. In addition to that, I also commute to work. So I put two hours of commuting daily on top of it. So that's definitely what I like least about my job. Well, um, for me, um, at least at this point, time is not an issue, thankfully, because I'm still working from home uh, during this environment. Uh, but I can sympathize, Demetra. Uh, I think for me, it's mainly that at the Red Cross, because we are a disaster organization, there is a certain amount of high flexibility that is needed because you never know when things are going to change. You never know when staff are going to deploy or are going to be busy with a local disaster. So you always have to be remaining flexible to move meetings around, to take on other work. Um, so it's just a high degree of flexibility here just because we have to adapt to the times and that's kind of the way disaster works. Um, so I think that that would be my biggest thing. And then another thing is working at a nonprofit. In general, sometimes you have to be um, able to be okay with the stability of the job because everywhere is different for if you will actually have job stability long term. So uh, when I first started with the American Red Cross, I was a grant funded position, which did not have a lot of job stability because it was really up to whoever was giving us money every year, if I would still have a job. Uh, so depending on what you do at a nonprofit and where the funding is coming from, it may make a difference in it being a stable position. So that may even be a good question to ask if you are applying for a nonprofit is what is the funding? Is it core budget? Is it from a grant? Um, and that may give you an idea of if it is a stable position. I would say that I kind of have a two part answer. One would be that my least favorite part is sometimes people just like to pull the fire alarm. And again, it's, it's advertising, no one's going to die. Lives are not being saved. And, you know, sometimes they just need maybe a little TLC and attention. The other thing would be honestly, being a woman in a real, a male dominated field is not always enjoyable. And I get to uh, work with uh, some characters and somehow for some reason, webmasters are very, I'm sorry if anyone here is a webmaster. If, and I, yes, webmasters are a real thing and they handle all the back end um, of websites and such. And they are um, lo lovely, special individuals. Um, and so, you know, having to deal with lots of different diverse personalities and needing to shut my mouth and zip it so I can keep it professional is hard sometimes. Yes, on that note. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's actually one of the things that, um, you know, bothers me a little bit about my job um, is having to answer. <laughs> to um, having to answer to, you know, a position uh, to a boss um, because, you know, the positions that you have, you know, um, you know, some of them are grant funded. And so there are rules, there are, you know, that you need to follow policies. Um, so you can have a great idea, um, but, you know, but then you have supervisors um on top of you and then they have supervisors so um sometimes i want to have flexibility um to to be able to think and do how you know the work the way that i feel that it's best done but i have a work plan that i have to follow um so that's one of the things that i don't necessarily enjoy that much and you know and if any of you are going to go into the field of you know, doing case planning or case management, you know, we all hate paperwork. <laughs> None of us like to do paperwork. And I'm going to compare myself to my husband. My husband also works for Jewish Board and I'm a psychotherapist. So I write 
My notes are really little. I may fight write for five minutes and I'm good. My husband is also a therapist um, and he writes essays <laughs> um, for a client after seeing a client. So, you know, so know what you're getting yourself into, you know, um, know, you know, like if you ever getting a job as a social worker or a therapist or whatever, like ask them, what is the requirement in regards to the paperwork? Because that can make a big difference in what you do. I don't have that much paperwork, but whenever I do have to write a little, I wish I could just see, continue to see client not, not having to write anything, but you got a document. So I would say that would be what um, I would hate the most. I don't do it a lot, but <laughs> I still hate it. Thank you guys. And who do we have up next? Hi, my name is Melissa, and I would like to ask, what challenged you most in the beginning of your career? I think one of the main challenges um, coming out of a master's and jumping straight into the work environment is kind of stressful. Um, but definitely something that I can tell you guys to do is don't wait until the last minute to start your job search. You should constantly be just looking, getting an idea of what you want to do, what's out there, what qualifications are needed for jobs that you think you might be interested in. Something that was really challenging for me in starting at the hospital was that I didn't necessarily have that medical background. So prior to starting, I did have to learn many, many medical abbreviations and medical terminology before I was able to start on the floor with the doctor. Um, so for me, I'm just going to date myself a little bit. So I graduated undergrad in 2010, and it was right after the 2008 uh, housing market crash. So I was trying to enter the job market in the middle of a recession. And it was hard. It was hard to kind of find a job. But luckily, AmeriCorps was around at the time. I believe it still is. So I decided, all right, I want to get some real world work experience, but also have like a good kind of transition from undergrad. So I joined specifically AmeriCorps National Civilian Community Corps, where I traveled the country for 10 months doing different service projects. And that really even fed my bug to work at a nonprofit and kind of do some disaster work. And it was really just like an amazing opportunity to gain just a slew of many different skills. In some ways, I feel like I learned more in that program than I did in my four years of undergrad, just because it was just a completely different hands-on experience. But even after I had my bachelor's and this um, job experience, I thought it would be super easy to get work, which it wasn't. So I decided to uh, do some work in the meantime, with uh, working at a daycare uh, just to get some more experience before I did another year of AmeriCorps for Habitat for Humanity. So I kind of just did like that slow progression in my career and I just would recommend just don't get your expectations too high. Just recognize that sometimes it is that process. If it's just one step at a time, one more door opens, one more door opens with each additional thing of experience that you have volunteer or work or AmeriCorps uh, or anything like that, it's still just additional experience that can bring you closer. Um, and then once I finally did start that uh, office job at Habitat for Humanity, um, I had to adjust to that nine to five. I was so used to kind of running around all day that it was very different for me to kind of sit in an office for um, such an extended period of time. So I had to really give myself an organized schedule uh, which was very useful just so I would recommend that if you are starting an office job for the first time, especially if it's going to be a full time office job, just to get yourself organized and get yourself into some sort of routine. Um, I know for me, I, that's how I started drinking coffee. <laughs> so it was very useful coffee. <laughs> ah, it's a, the nectar of the gods. So with that I would say two things. One that I still am challenged with is 
you know, when you're looking or when I'm looking at job applications or different positions and such, I see all these qualifications that they're writing down. And I'm like, I don't need any of that. I'm not applying. Like, but what I've come to realize being on the flip side of those things is that's not necessarily, that's like the dream applicant. Those are not requirements. Like if you don't, you know, it's not like, oh, you have brown eyes, then you can get in. It's not something like that. It's more just you know, checking the box in the dream. So putting myself out there to this day is definitely challenging and applying for positions. And then second of all, Honestly, when I realized that I wanted to go into data science, I did a data science boot camp and I failed miserably. Like I'm talking bad. Um, and I, I have my doctorate and I was a professor of cognitive development at the same time as going through this. And it was a program where they all, none of them had ever used SBSS. They kind of smirked at me. They were all physicists, which is a whole other conversation. Um, and they kind of smirked at me. And I knew that I was really far behind. I didn't know Python. I did not really excel at it at first. I had to like veer into using R just so I could start to, because R is much closer in alignment to SBSS and such and then get to learn that way. And I'll be honest with you, I did not ever necessarily, I did not pass the program in its entirety because I, to this day, cannot complete, a, it's called map reducing, it's in data science. I assure you, it's not really a real life skill that one needs, nor would you ever perform it on a daily basis. But hey, I, I have a job, a roof over my head, things worked out, but I failed. But I kept going. So I think that's really what it takes. But yeah, I've, I've definitely been challenged and bombed. Yeah. I have to say, um, you know, in regards to the challenges, I think I was pretty lucky in the sense that I started working since I was 14 years old, you know, summer youth employment, um, summer youth. When I um, was a senior in high school, I worked as a beautician. I went to Sarah J. Hell High School. Um, you guys have no idea what that is <laughs> in Brooklyn, um, where I got a, you know, it was a focus in cosmetology where I learned how to do hair and makeup and nails. Um, so I had a job there. So I think I've been working pretty much, you know, all my life, you know, like um, since I was a teenager, I've always had a position. So I believe that I was very confident going into um, after getting my degree because I was never unemployed in my life. Um, so I was pretty confident that I had job skills, that I had office skills, that I had telephone skills, that I had people skills, um, you know, so I was very confident. So, um, so I would encourage you, whatever you can do, and even have, have, have been uh, an administrator, an executive director on the hiring end, hiring people, um, you know, and I feel, and I have siblings, and I have you know, family and I have friends and they're like, oh, you know, I try to get a job, but, you know, they tell me I don't have experience and, you know, and I feel bad. I'm like, you know, where are they supposed to get the experience from if nobody gives them a chance, you know? So that has always been a challenge for many people um, because nobody wants to give you, you know, people ask you to come with experience. Like, well, I'm trying to get the experience, right? So I would encourage you all um, as you're thinking about you know, your dream job is if there's any opportunity to volunteer in your dream job, you know, do so. I know I took, I, you know, I would hire someone as a volunteer in, a, in two weeks as an executive director. In two weeks, I gave them a paid job, you know, um, because, you know, hiring them as a volunteer, you know, didn't cost me anything, but it, it, it didn't really take a long time for me to figure out these people's skills. Um, so, you know, so that's what I would encourage, you know, anyone to do is to, you know, volunteer, put something on your resume. It's, you know, it's almost as if, you know, nobody's going, you know, I, I know my mom used to say that nobody's going to give you Nobody's gonna invite you to their house unless you have a home. <laughs> you know, kind of like, you know, when you are unemployed, you don't have a history, you know, people don't don't wanna take a chance 
Um, um, and so I would say, you know, put yourself out there, try to volunteer, even if it's for a little bit. Um, it may it may be the the place that you want, but it might lead. It may not be the place that you want to work, but it might lead to something. You might get to know somebody, because it is a lot of people do get jobs because of who you know. Um, so if you are connected to a you know an organization. You can move in within that organization or somebody at that organization might know somebody else or just having it on your resume is just very important. Thank you. And so true. I got my first good job break. I'm going to call it, I had a lot of jobs. My first good job break came from meeting people at a coffee truck because I worked across the street at the terrible place. And then I got a job at the good place across the street with benefits and paid time off and all the good things. So yeah, just meet people networking and you never know what career path you're gonna be on. So just, you know, kind of take it as it comes. Uh, so I wanna be respectful of everyone's time today. Um, thank you to all the students that asked questions, the panel questions that were assigned. Uh, but I know we had some students in the room uh, who were not assigned questions, but wanted to ask questions. So I want to give them the opportunity to raise their hand and I can unmute you uh, or, okay, Roshana, I will do that now. You're ready. I see you. Hi, my name is Roshana and, and I was wondering, um, I guess, uh, what would you advise us to do, do for the people that want to go to graduate school? Demetra, you want to take that one? We didn't get to that list of questions, so this is a great opportunity to do that. Yeah, absolutely. So I know we're all behavioral science majors in here, so you're not all psychology. Um, so more so targeted towards the psychology people, but also, I guess, sociology and other types of science majors. One thing that's really important when applying to graduate school is having some sort of a background in research. Um, especially in psychology. When I was undergrad, I first started doing research when I was a sophomore. There are so many opportunities at Mercy to get involved in research that you might not know about. And that first is doing summer research through the, St the STEM Summer Research Academy. Great opportunity. You learn so much, whether you like working alone or you like working as a group, that's the best opportunity because you get the best of both worlds there. You learn about data, you learn how to look for articles, you learn how to analyze. And then from there, you get to go into presenting at conferences and maybe even publishing a paper. In addition, a lot of faculty at Mercy is working on their own independent research. So reach out to your professors in classes, ask them if they're working on research, ask if they need help, if to look up articles or to analyze something for them. Most of the time, they would absolutely love to give you the opportunity to help. Also, it helps them a lot as well. So just be open, communicate with your professors. And that would be one of the most important things I would say to do before applying to grad school. Yeah, and I would say, Roshana, if um, you, know, you weren't very specific about you know, what type of grad school you're interested in, you know, so that's, that's very important to know um, when you're thinking about grad school. So I was an undergrad and my major was French and language, and I got a master's degree in social work. Um, and so, you know, um, know what you want to, you know, what career you want to you pursue, you know, identify the schools or the career that you want? Do you want to be a social worker? Do you want to be a mental health therapist? You know, do you know, do you want to get into research? You want to work at a hospital? Um, you want to find out what you want and then you'll figure out, okay, so here are the schools that I want to apply to. Um, and then we know social work schools, you know, it's good that you have a story, you know, if you do is wonderful, you know, you want to start thinking about because that essay and your you know, and your and your GPA and your grades, that's what's gonna get you into grad school. What are your grades? Do you meet the criteria? Okay, and then, you know, for social work, whether it's Hunter, Stony Brook or Adelphi, you know- Or Mercy. No. Or Mercy, <laughs> Mercy. They wanna know about you, 
right? They want to well, know about the- social work. We don't have a master in social work. We don't have a master in social work. We have mental health counseling. They have mental health counseling. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so know what you want to do. And then, you know, um, you know, and p- be prepared to write an essay, you know, um, answer the questions, get help with the essay so that, you know, they can see that you can both write well enough for grad school, as well as you have a story, you have something to bring, you know, like if you've had a rough life or if your friend had a rough life, you know, like things that could make you stand out, you know, in the crowd mm-hmm. and get help in writing that essay if you can. Right, thank you. I think we can do one more question if anyone has one, if anyone wants to raise their hand. Okay, so Maria. And hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, would you recommend going straight into grad school or would you recommend taking a year off? Because I know some people say that it's better to take a year off, but others say to go straight through. Um, I can, I guess, start with that because I went to grad school, I believe, like five or six years after I did undergrad. Um, and I thought that that was great for my specific program. So I went for a master's in public administration. So it was really beneficial to bring real world experience into the classroom. So for me specifically, I felt like I would have been a little bit overwhelmed if I didn't have that background experience and I wouldn't have gotten as much out of that um, specific program. But again, I think it depends upon what masters you are really going for. Um, I also just wanted to piggyback with, I guess, another quick tip about grad school is I didn't quite know what I wanted to do for grad school when I was an undergrad. I was considering a master's in social work, but I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. So that is part of the reason why I took extra courses. And one of the courses that I took was I just took a math course. I took calculus um, just for the heck of it. Um, And when I applied to grad school, that actually came in handy because they showed that like, okay, I have like a little bit more uh, skills. I have just tried to do this math course at the higher level and I did well. So sometimes if you have those different um, backgrounds that can really help boost your um, resume and your um, essay for grad school. Thank you so much. Great advice. We've got time. Well, we're a little over, but Brie has a question, so I'm going to unmute her. We'll take that as the last question. Hi, Brie. Hi. Um, this question is for Eva. I wanted to ask, um, do you have any, devi- any advice for someone who wants to pursue a career in social work? Yes. Um, as I was sharing with Rashana, um, and then I would also say, um, if you don't like school <laughs> and, um, you know, I say, get it done. <laughs> yeah. If you know what you want to be, I, I would say, you know, uh, go to school and, um, you know, because when things are fresh, um, in your mind, when, you know, you're used to writing papers, you know, I, I mean, if you take a semester off, that might work, but, you know, for some people, it's really tough trying to get back in. So if you are able to, to do it right away, do it. Um, as, in, as, as I shared with Roshana, um, you're trying to get into the school of, school of social work, find out what their requirements are, gather up all the schools and figure out which schools are best. I could tell you, um, you, know, um, you know, if it's social work that you're looking for, there's just so many opportunities. And, you know, in New York City, you have Hunter, you have Stony Brook. I chose, I, I remember applying for Hunter and I had an interview for Hunter um, and I went to it and, um, you know, and it was, it was a, you know, very interesting interview. It was a group of people. Uh, Hunter had a lot of applicants and so not all of us could get in. So there were people on the wait list, but then I interviewed with Stony Brook and then I knew Stony Brook was the place for me. Um, because, you know, I felt like, you know, the type, you know, it was for me, I felt like it would be more relaxing to drive to Stony Brook, um, as opposed to, um, Stony, yeah, of course, Stony Brook now has a campus in Manhattan. Um, so I enjoyed driving to Stony Brook instead of 
traveling to the train from Brooklyn to Manhattan um, an hour and a half. Um, so, so that was important. It's important to know what type of school you want to go to. Do you want to be on campus? Do you want to be off campus? You know, are you going to work? Um, you know, so, so that's really important. Um, it's important to find out, you know, what are the requirements of getting into that school and identify, do you have that? Um, speak to mentors. Now, if anyone, you know, I would make myself available. Um, you know, this is not related to any of my jobs, but just like I always like to give back, you know, so I want, you know, here's my, well, this email address is for Jewish board. I'm going to write in the chat my, um, my personal email address. If anybody needs more assistance, you know, in regards to School of Social Work, you know, um, you know, I hope it's okay, Sarah. <laughs> oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please do so. You can send it to everybody in the room by choosing everyone. Well, thank you so much, guys. Julia, do you have some closing remarks? Oh, let me unmute myself. Yes, I do. Thank you so much to all the panelists um, for providing such valuable information to our students here. And thank you to all the students for attending. I hope you found this really informative and useful. And um, I wanted to just let you, the students know that tomorrow morning at 11, um, we are going to have an information session on the Masters of Science program in psychology um, at Mercy College. So Dr. Rebecca Trends, who is the program di director of the master's program, is going to be talking about the program itself in terms of expectations, how to apply. She will also be discussing the four plus one program um, where you could earn your master's while you're an undergraduate student. And they just opened it up to um, an opportunity where students could earn their KSAC degree, which is a cert certification in alcohol and substance abuse. So if you're interested in attending, I am going to send the registration link in the chat now. So there it is. Uh, go ahead and click on the link, register, and you'll get a Zoom link sent to your Mercy email. So make sure you register with your Mercy email. Again, thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate it. Yes, thank you guys so much. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, students. Everyone have a great evening. Thank we you. really appreciate you coming today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. thank you, everybody. Good luck with your careers. Thank you so much. All right.